Thank you so much for coming to what is the first ever Axios event in the city, and certainly our first Axios BFD. We are here to talk with the top deal makers and business leaders of the city, everything from sports to venture capital to private equity to food to hospitality with a little bit of politics mixed in. Uh, to our audience at home, please follow along with the hashtag AxiosBFD on Facebook and Instagram and X and all the other platforms. And let's get going. Uh, I want to invite my first guest up here, Keith Rebois. Which I messed up how to pronounce your name. Right like that. All right, so Keith, uh, when I asked you to join us here, you were a partner at Founders Fund uh, with, uh, with, with Peter Thiel, who was your former uh, Stanford classmate and, and um, PayPal colleague. And then the day we were going to announce the event, you were no longer at Founders Fund. You announced you were going back to Coastal Ventures, where you had been for years before FF. Why did you switch shops? I wanted to give you news. You know, I wanted and to make sure that it. people were paying attention. I mean, you actually broke this story in 2019 when I left KV the first time I went to Founders Fund. Um, it, Axios, I think, had the exclusive on yep. that. So, um, you know, I spent six years at Coastal Ventures, and I spent five years at Founders Fund. And they're actually closer cousins in venture capital than most firms. Um, when I was leaving KV the first time, uh, one of my friends who's very successful, who gave me advice, said this is one of those 60-40 decisions in life. So I sort of unwound it and made it the other 40-60. Um, I think there's two possible ways to be successful in life and in technology companies. There's input-driven organizations and there's output-driven organizations. So think Amazon, Apple, input-driven organizations, Google, Meta, output-driven organizations. And some people do better in some environments, some people do better or happier in other environments. I'm definitely an input-driven organization. FF is the extreme output. Like, you come up with the next SpaceX, you're a genius, that's the most important thing. Uh, at KV, we're input-driven, which is the rigor of your analysis, the quality of your thinking, the quality of the uh, isolating the key questions in your memo. And I like inputs. I like Apple-style thinking. I uh, actually, my company I run here in Miami is uh, called OpenStore. One of our four key values is sweat the inputs. So I think people just will thrive better in different environments. I'm also very early, typically, as an investor when I've been successful. And I'm very impactful when I've been successful. And I think that style is better for me at KV personally. So something else you mentioned to me when you, when you made the switch, when I called to say, what the hell, uh, was the kind of a collaboration thing. That, that Founders Fund is a little bit more siloed. The people kind of, once they have their ideas, you say, they, they, they move straight ahead. Whereas KV is a little bit more collaborative. I, I'm curious, how does that collaboration work when you're here in Miami and almost all of your colleagues are in the Bay Area? I don't think it would have been possible had I not spent six years. So all the senior people at KV, it shows you the glacial pace of venture, I guess. All the senior people at KV are exact same as five years ago. Uh, so without those pre-existing relationships and knowledge and uh, just understanding of people, it would not be possible. I still will be in the Bay Area probably once a month, um, board meetings with investments, um, partner meetings. Uh, we do do the canonical, historical Monday partner meetings, and we debate investments. People come in, entrepreneurs come in and pitch us, and then we have a dialogue about the conversation. Uh, so I'll, I'll probably be there a little bit more frequently than I have been over the last three years. I referred to you this morning as the Pied Piper of Miami tech and venture capital. You're the guy who almost any time anyone ever says, I spent a weekend in Miami, that was nice. You tweet out, you should move here. You're like, here's the real estate listings, come. There's a perception that a lot of, not a lot, but at least a, a decent percentage of the people who seem to come here during the pandemic, particularly in the height of the pandemic, from the Bay Area particularly, have now moved back, like, particularly when it comes to venture capitalists and technology folks. Do you feel that's accurate? It's definitely not accurate because it would show up in stats. And you know, if you've watched the Gavin Newsom DeSantis debate, there's nobody leaving Florida to go to California. That's like fiction. Like there literally is nobody. The net migration here is like overwhelming. I do know one person, I guess, who moved to Miami and moved back. I do know some people who moved to Miami and flip and flop before between New York, which has always been you know a financial corridor thing to do. But I literally can name only one social or professional person I've ever met in my life that moved, was in Miami and went back. How, how much more, because again, since you used to live in California and you used to invest in, in, obviously you were an executive too, but when you're investing in companies, how much more of your job now, and actually even of founders, local founders here, is recruiting more so than even the value? Because it's one thing, you all, it's always hard to convince somebody to change jobs or join a company. It's even harder to say, oh, and also please move a couple thousand miles. 
It's definitely a part of the job. The role, like, and so more as a CEO than as a VC. So I'm a CEO and a VC at the same time. And the CEO job, I'm trying to move talented people that often have families uh, to Miami. Now, fortunately, when they come with their spouse and their kids sometimes and they tour the area, they're usually sold. But the initial step, the inertia, is I've got to get them to come here, try it, like walk outside, like literally walk outside the hangar right now. It's pretty easy to convince people to stay. Does it, how much does it matter for you as a VC? In other words, if you've got a founding team that's here with a couple people and they're like, you know, we're going to have to hire X number of engineers, do you care if those engineers are here or if they're somewhere else at this point? I, there used to be a VC thing where you kind of wanted most people, particularly when the startup was young, to be in the same room. So I personally believe that they need to be in the same room and I want them here. I believe that startups are almost impossible to create except IRL five days a week in the office collectively together. There may be a point in scaling a company when the momentum kicks in, when the accumulating advantages kick in, when the network effect kicks in, when you have a quasi-monopoly, that that's not true. But early stage, I think you learn by osmosis, you hire undiscovered talent, and those people need to be in pro close proximity with leadership. Let me ask you one last recruiting question. Uh, you and I last sat down in April, back when you were still a Founders Fund. I was in Miami last April, and it was shortly after DeSantis had signed the abortion bill, and I asked you, are you seeing any troubles bringing in particularly younger female, whether it be engineers or other, other people for startups? And you said, ask me in a year. So I'm asking you in a year. No, no detectable difference. No detectable difference between male, female, married, unmarried. I think there's a difference when you have a spouse that there's another decision maker in that unit and you have to change your recruiting process to rope in the spouse as early as possible in the recruiting process. So I will try to bring the spouse like during the interview loop, not have the person go home and say, I want to move to Miami, and the spouse say, what the hell? You know, so it's easier as a unit, but that's the biggest fundamental difference. The abortion thing doesn't come up during those it, conversations? I have never, nobody, actually, you may be surprised by this because you live in a you know, left state. People here are not all debating all these things constantly. No, no, but you're talking about bringing people from yeah, those yeah, states yeah. Oh, here. It, no, but it hasn't come up as a filter at all. It, it is like, what is school district? What schools can I get my kid into? Absolutely. What are the best schools? Send me links. That's all the time. I'm like, I actually feel like I'm a school counselor. Uh, let me ask something separate, which is I get the sense uh, from talking to entrepreneurs here and, and that and crypto has come back as an industry, but that there was almost two Miami tech scenes. There was the regular tech scene and the crypto scene, and almost never the two shall meet. They almost, is I, that I, still I, accurate? I agree with that, actually. I think they were sort of almost no overlap, except maybe at some major events and they were kind of in their parallel universe, and I think they're back in their parallel universes. Is there, from your perspective, a next Miami? Or, let me rephrase, what is the next Miami? I wish I knew, so tell me, if you find one, please. Um, I don't think there's one in the United States. Like, I think I've exhausted the cities in the United States. I've lived in seven or eight or nine myself, so I think I have a pretty good feel for like, the landscape here. Is there opportunities outside the United States? Almost surely, yes. Let's talk bigger VC things, and, and so let's, let's talk AI, because I, I get every press release from every startup, and I don't remember the last one that somehow wasn't AI-powered or, or an AI platform. It's always there. It does not matter what they do. How do you, as an investor who I assume is seeing these also on pitch decks or emails or calls, how do you define AI? That, that's even a better question. Um, so you're right. Like I saw my former colleague at Founders Fund uh, did a podcast yesterday and I was listening to it and he said 100% of all pitch decks that he's seen in the last year have AI in the first two slides. Sure. It's, it's probably about right. Um, so I don't know, you know, I think a lot of people use AI without defining it. Mostly they mean it's like maybe like regression, like linear regression is like the amateur version. There's, there are some that actually are using AI to do things that were actually impossible with advanced statistics. And that actually is interesting. Now, fortunately, I'm now at the firm that has actually pioneered investing in AI. We're the only institutional investor that had invested in open AI. And we have two, two of my uh, managing director partners are actually AI experts. So we actually are leaning into AI, but we have the expertise to do it and be able to separate the real from the fake. But most people when you can't. say the fake, what is the fake? So you get you get the deck and you and you dig in and you what what makes you say, well, that's bullshit. 
Uh, well, I'll, I'll give you an old Peter Thielism. Is by the time something's a buzzword, by something's you know popular, it, it basically means it's all fake. And there's there's some truth to that. The people who really pioneer in AI were doing this in 2012, 13, 14, 15. OpenAI was founded in 15. So I, I think the fast followers in a vertical can be interesting. It's like reinventing a law through AI can be done. Reinventing accounting through AI can be done. Reinventing medicine through AI can absolutely be done. But the foundational principles, people who are really doing AI forward startups, I think that innovation is not now, it was already being baked. You were not back with Coastal when, when the open AI. I actually was. Oh, were you? Yeah, what? yeah, yeah. Oh, you absolutely, were? Okay. Absolutely. So what was, the, what was the sense in there when you find out, as a firm, I guess, find out Sam got fired? Uh, well, you know, Sam officiated my wedding, so I wasn't particularly happy. Um, but, um, and I'm sure KV wasn't particularly thrilled because one of the theses in investing in open AI was we're investing in Sam. So, I mean, do you believe if he had stayed out, would it have gone? What, what, what it would have gone to zero, AI? literally zero. As an investor in open AI, and granted, you're not a majority investor, do you view open AI as an independent company or is it essentially a de facto subsidiary of Microsoft? It's, it's, it's very complicated. I mean, they're the most complicated governance structure I've ever seen in my life. And I used to be a lawyer. Uh, so I just yeah. look at complicated documents all the time. I can't really figure it out, honestly. Um, so, and I think there are historical reasons and roots to But the, I mean, even, even by the idea that, that it seemed to be that, that Satya Nadella, CEO of Microsoft, seems to be the one who was able to force the board of a supposedly independent company to bring a CEO back. Well, I think if you think about it this way, Microsoft is subsidizing a significant amount of the R&D. Yep. And you know, the bills for this R&D are very, very expensive, measured in billions and arguably trillions of dollars if you believe the media. And so there's not that many people on the planet who can fund billions of dollars of R&D, so he probably had a lot of leverage. The, the kind of the AI boom, this, this strikes me a bit, and a lot of people say, you know, this is the, the, the next massive, whether you want to say platform shift, maybe as much internet, whether you want to say mobile or cloud. One of the things that was notable kind of during the, the original internet boom was it, it sparked this new generation of venture capitalists, because the folks who had been venture capitalists through the 90s didn't really necessarily understand it, or most of them didn't, some did. Do you feel, you're, the, you're a guy who made his bones in venture during the last platform shifts. Are you freaked out that you're a dinosaur? I, well, I'm always freaked out that I'm a dinosaur. Age is not your friend as a VC. Like, it's really hard to, uh, to stay relevant as a VC. You kind of have to be like Madonna or something and reinvent yourself every decade. I don't think, have you, uh, yeah, okay, go on. <laughs> I don't know if that's um, what you want But, or, you know, it's very rare. It, and it's difficult. I mean, I, I, I actually did do the internet reasonably well. I survived mobile. Sort of hit some cloud stuff. But uh, I, I think uh, I'm paranoid about this. Now, that's why I'm so excited that actually two of my key colleagues are truly AI experts and really do understand. So I don't have to like learn this whole new revolution. I can still find the most impressive founders and back them and Vinod and Sven can catch my blind spots. Like if I don't understand the substance, I'm missing the substance, they will, they will correct me. I just need to find extraordinary people that want to do extraordinary things. You mentioned Vinod, uh, Vinod Koslo, the, the eponymous, uh, the founder of, of Coastal Ventures. In one line, what's the biggest difference as an investor between him and Teal? Uh, well, Vinod's a technology investor, meaning like he sees the immediate implications of any new technology and how it might transform industries. Peter is more a founder-driven investor and also an amazing business strategist of like this business is going all the way to the moon because of X, Y, and Z. You recently said in an interview that you were talking about the difference between early stage investing and later stage investing. And you said when it came to later stage that it's really more about timing than it is anything else. And you have these kind of two to three year windows. Did I catch that right? And if I did, and I would assume we're not in one right now, should KV give back its growth fund that it raised like a year ago? Uh, I'm not going to pine about other people. Like we don't, so we, no, no, I'm talking about oh, oh, KV. Coastal, okay, so yeah, yeah. I'm sorry, so to be fund. very precise, KV, we have a $415 million seed fund. We have a $1.4 or $5 billion venture fund and a $900 million opportunity fund. Yeah, it's that and, one. And so the weighting of those things reflects the strategy. $400 million in seed is being bold and early. Venture capital, traditional venture capital, $1.5 billion is a lot of venture capital. And then we do have an opportunity fund to cherry pick opportunities that make sense. Whereas like other funds have very different weightings and you can see it, your weighting is your strategy in some ways. So what I meant by that 
conversation is if you're doing what I do, which is find two kids on a planet that want to reinvent financial services in their proverbial garage, the timing of that does not matter. It's going to take eight to 20 years for them to be successful. Trying to predict the world in eight to 20 years is a fool's errand. So I just need to be right. Are these people, do they have some probability of success and can I help them? That's all I need to worry about as an early stage seed and series A investor. Okay. You, you've mentioned earlier that you're also CEO of this other fr- the company, which is Open Store. You have a job, you're a, you're a general partner, a partner at a venture capital fund. Why are you also CEO of an actual company? Because I'm crazy. I'm like, well, Elon's running six companies. I can. As an, inv- <laughs> as an investor, if I'm an investor in Open Store, and I know you are, so you wear both hats, but if I'm an investor in Open Store, why do I want my CEO yeah. to have a second job? No, so here's, here's how to think about it. One, if you start a company, you create proprietary deal flow. So that's the best thing ever in venture capital. So as a VC, if I can create proprietary deal flow, I did this at Open Door back at KV. When I joined KV, the first year I was at KV, we incubated Open Door, who's was very successful as an investment. Um, similarly, uh, Workday, very large public company, uh, co-founded and co-CEO by a general partner at Greylock at the time. Um, obviously, Peter started Palantir while he was mostly an investor. So the track record's pretty good. Now, there are trade-offs to me as CEO. But, right, because right, you're still CEO. You didn't just found it. You, you're still running the so show. The, the CEO trade-off is very real. And I have to add value in different ways to offset the time loss. Like, I cannot be 24-7 at the open store office and serve on 10-plus boards and find new entrepreneurs every day. So I need to add enough value that offsets that. And it's a challenge every day. It's not easy, but it's easier than running six companies, I'm pretty sure. Do you feel, do do you see a spot, a a time in which you want to hand the reins off to somebody else, whether they be internal or external? I think as long as the company's in innovation mode versus execution mode, I think I'm pretty damn good at the innovation mode, problem solving. Like, we need to solve a problem that no one else has figured out how to do before. I drive that, that process and those people pretty well. Once we figured everything out and it's kicking in, there are other people who can drive an organization more successfully to optimize and optimize and optimize. It's like a football, so we just finished some football season. If you're going to run three yards, four yards, and just run the ball, run the ball, there are people who can do that better than me. If you need, you know, to connect some 40-yard passes downfield, I can do that. You're saying you're Mahomes. That's where you are in this? Really? Is that where we're going with this? Probably a little better than me, at least some things. I'm curious. When you think back to when you started Open Store, which kind of focuses or or works particularly with, with Shopify merchants, how much more competitive is the market than when you started it? Because there seems to be, and tell me if I'm wrong about this, it seems to be there are a bunch of other Open Store or Open Store aspirants out there. Well, there was three years ago. We started this company three years ago in Miami, and literally three years ago, and we had arguably competitors. There was these other companies that were trying to acquire long-tail business, stitch them together to build something. There's nobody else trying to build anything by stitching together companies anymore. Now, partially because everybody else's model was based upon arbitrage. So at the time, the market was trading here. They're like, I can buy at this EBITDA and trade at this. That arbitrage is gone. So if you had an arbitrage model, you know, it's just like... Shoot, shoot them, and they've all basically died. I think there's some outside the United States, like Latin America and Europe. Yep. There might be some, but there's nobody in the United States that tries to do what we do. That doesn't mean that what we're going to do is successful, <laughs> but it does mean that nobody else is trying. You, you, I, I mean, almost famously, but when you started this, you were like, we're not doing Amazon sellers. Like, we're Shopify sellers. We're not doing Amazon sellers. Given what's happened with some of those Amazon roll-ups, have you considered, you know what, there might be some very low-hanging cheap fruit here to pick up? The reason why we don't really prioritize Amazon is Amazon is great at what Amazon does. And so your ability to create leverage on top of an Amazon business is virtually zero. So Amazon does customer acquisition for those stores. Amazon does fulfillment. If you run a Shopify store, you need to do new customer acquisition. You need to do retention marketing. You need to do customer support. You need to do shipping and fulfillment. So we can create economies of scale and accumulating advantages across three, four, five different areas. If we bought a Shopify store, I'm not sure how we'd create any leverage. I'm curious. I want to just go back a second, and we only have about a minute and a half left. When you were an entrepreneur, when you were, you were in tech before you became a venture capitalist, what did you think of venture capitalists? Because there's some entrepreneurs who swear by their VCs, and they help me find them, and there's some who are just like... Well, I'm glad for the check, but man, I wish they would just leave me the hell alone. The reality is there's five or 10 VCs that are actually pretty useful to an entrepreneur. And would you like to name them? Sure. I mean, I, you know, I've had them on the board of the companies I worked with. I mean, that, that was actually my view is like, go get the best possible VCs that can give you advice and feedback. So for example, one of my partners at KV is on my board at Open Store before 
you know, before I joined, rejoined KV. And he gave me very insightful feedback at the board meeting on Thursday that actually changed my mind. He's also on the board of Delian's company at Varda, and he gave Delian useful advice that probably has helped propel Varda to be a successful company. That's what you want from your VC. So I had that benefit at Square. Roloff was on my board, Roloff of Skoya. He's incredibly insightful. He's very useful. But there's only like literally three to 10 of us. <laughs> only three to 10. Wait, so the rest, that's three to 10. I mean, Coastal alone, you have uh, maybe not more than 10, but you're getting close. Fair uh -huh. enough. Uh, Keith, thank you so much for joining us. Pleasure to be with you.